worship you. I can only imagine. Encouraging music, words of hope, positive, encouraging K love. I'm Lori. I know the weekend can be sometimes um, an isolating place. We're not at work, we're not around people. Um, and if you today are finding yourself that you just need to connect with somebody, a pastor perhaps, that's what our Kayla pastors are here for. They are here for you. So you don't have to be alone today. If you just need to find somebody on the other end of that phone, you can call them right now. Let me give you the phone number. Um, it's 800-525-5683. And if that's too many numbers to remember, just go over to Caleb.com and use the keyword prayer to find them there.
Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen? Amen. Amen. Listen, just a couple of announcements before we get started this morning. We're going to, in our corporate prayer time, we're going to have a little time to break out. We're going to pray for what's going on in the Ukraine and Russia, so be prepared for that. Just outside these doors, Debbie Phipps has a little display of Ukrainian crafts that they made there. Um, they're available for a donation. Go out there and see them after service. You can see her for more information about that. But be prepared. We're going to have a special time of prayer in just a moment for that. Lord's Supper, the end of the service. So let's start preparing our hearts and preparing to gather around the table at the end of the service this morning. Tonight at 4.30 we begin our afternoon ministries. Children's Choir and, children, and Zip, Impact Youth. There is a ladies' study on Jude. And we also have an evangelism training class called Three Circles. So if you're interested in any of those, show up at 4.30 and come and be a part of that. But again, my disclaimer about my evangelism class, it's a practice, practice, practice class. So if you're not comfortable with pairing up with people and sharing your faith or learning how to share your faith, be prepared about that. Last but not least, I want to get, a, I want to get as many people at Young at Heart on Thursday morning at 11.30. My good buddy Tim Coker is coming to share Thursday morning for Young at Heart. And I want Tim to see what a great senior program we got. So y'all pack it in there, all right? I've, I've done two of his senior programs for his Christmas program already. So anyways, um, he owes me. So he's going to be here Thursday, 1130. Y'all come and, and, and support that. Let's have a word of prayer preparing our hearts as we enter into worship this morning. Father, it's a joy to have fellowship and such a great connection with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. But we also don't want to just be so casual about coming into your presence. That we are gathered to worship you, glorify you, magnify you, exalt the name of Jesus. Prepare our hearts, set our minds on the things above, and wipe from our minds any distractions, any unclean thoughts or impure thoughts. Give us clean hearts and steadfast spirit. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. William Cooper wrote a poem, I'm not sure how many years ago, but it's been a good while. And Nancy Roberts put that poem to music. And I don't know if this is where we get the saying from his poem or not that God moves in a mysterious way. Well, that's what Carolyn and I played this morning, is his poem, but you did not hear the words, but we all, you heard the music to Nancy Roberts' setting. The words to his poem are like this. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea, and rides upon the storm. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds that ye so much dread, those clouds are big with mercy and shall break with blessing on thy head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. So with that in mind, let's stand together and sing, Blessed be the name of the Lord Most High. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord Most High. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord Most High. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord Most High. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord Most High. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. <coughs> Jesus, my Lord, He the mighty king master of everything his name is wonderful jesus my lord he's the great shepherd the rock of all ages the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and in earth, at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus. wonderful isn't the name of Jesus wonderful chains are broken when it's spoken every knee must bow isn't the name of Jesus wonderful isn't the name of Jesus Wonderful, isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Amen. You may be seated. I want you to pay attention to the video for about a minute, and we're going to have some special time of prayer following it. Rain God, come and turn this thing around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. Yes. God, turn it around. God, turn.
tell you all what's going on in Ukraine right now and Russia. Jesus said that my house should be a house of prayer. And so we're going to turn this into a house of prayer for just a minute or two. So we're going to ask, we're going to have prayer triangles, prayer circles, prayer squares this morning. I want you all to get in little groups of three, four, two. If you want to go by yourself, just get in little groups. And we've got some prayer prompts we're going to go through. So y'all go ahead and break out. Find some people. Come on. Come on. Come on. Find some people to pray with choir however you want to do it back there and we're gonna lead you through just a, a few prayer prompts real quick this morning cam where's the first one on there if you look on the, the the screen up there i want you to start praying for an end to the conflict and for the peace of christ to overwhelm them all right and when i'll give you a, 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 about 30 seconds 45 seconds we'll move on to the next prayer prompt so let's start praying for an end to the conflict and for the peace of christ to overwhelm them all right Father, we're praying, Lord, that you just would just as you continue to pray, we're going to pray for the people in Ukraine and in Russia people in Ukraine are suffering and there's Christians in Russia who are just trying to change the country with the gospel would you pray for the people in Ukraine and in Russia As you continue to pray, we need to pray for our decision makers around the world. Presidents, prime ministers, leaders, to have wisdom, to have discernment, and divine guidance. So pray for the, the leaders all around the world and decision makers with this conflict going on. Finally, as you continue to pray, we need to pray for the church, the church in America, the church all over the world, the church in Ukraine, the church in Russia, that believers would be strengthened, would proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in times like this, that people will see that there is hope only through Jesus Christ.
Father, what a privilege it is to pray as the, the church together. And Lord, as we just gather our hearts this morning, praying, lifting up what's going on in Ukraine, this invasion, that you would supernaturally just thwart it, thwart the, the plans of the evil one. We pray for your peace, peace that only comes through Jesus Christ, to just sweep through in a transformational, miraculous way. We're praying for the people in, in Ukraine and Russia. Lord, that you would raise up the believers, strengthen their faith, and bring those who are lost to know you and trust you and seek you. We pray for your supernatural help upon the people here. Pray for the leaders all around the world, Lord, here in this country, to have wisdom, to be divinely guided by you. May it be your hand, your guidance, and the right decisions to make in this time, Lord. And finally, Lord, we're praying that we be bold as a church, sharing Jesus, pointing others to him, proclaiming the gospel, that people are lost and separated from you and unless they turn from their sins and turn to Jesus. We thank you for the privilege of prayer. And we lift up what's going on right now in Ukraine and Russia. In Jesus Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Can't help but think of a... I think it was even on the national news. But I know it was on Facebook. All the Christians are many Christians in Ukraine who gathered down in subways and they started to sing. I don't know the song they sang, but it was one of their, one of their church songs. They don't know what the future holds for them. You know, and even this morning I was complaining about the gas to Carolyn. I said, I wonder how much it's gone up. Went by the gas station. Sure enough, it's gone up. Go to the grocery store and a less bag each time seems to cost more than when you didn't, when you had more bags. And we just, uh, all right, excuse me, I won't say we. I think, boy, we're in just bad shape. But then I look at the news and look at these aerial shots of different areas, what it looked like a month ago, and now what it looks like after all the bombing, apartment building after apartment building destroyed. They've lost everything. And it's not nearly over. So, God speed to those folks, especially those Christians who are hunkered down. May they and may we ask the Lord, Lord, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Will he really be Lord of my heart? Let's stand and sing. my light be thou my wisdom and thou my true word I ever with thee and thou with me Lord thou my great father I thy true Or man. 
man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won, may I reach heaven's joys, bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, Whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Good morning. I don't know why I'm... Excuse me. I don't know why I'm still amazed at the level of giving that you all do. We just had our, the youth fundraiser last Sunday night, which raised in excess of $2,700. That just speaks volumes to this. I think that's worthy of some applause. In fact, they're the future of our church, community, and nation, so we need to do all we can to support them. So our giving... To, to give an example of how this is being used, and, and this is for missions specifically, but uh, we got a report back from Frankie Tanner last uh, Tuesday morning that he's down in the Nicaragua area. He'll be back on the 12th of this month. They've seen over 400 people come to Christ. I'd love to see that kind of hunger here in the United States. So please come tonight to this evangelism course because that's all the only way we're going to be able to to see that kind of results is to get people out there talking to people. So pray with me. So Father, I thank you so much for this time. This is an exciting time of the service where we get to give back just a little bit of what you've given to us. You've blessed us so richly. And we thank you so much. Again, we're talking about Ukraine and Russia. We've got brothers and sisters over there that are going through and just suffering horrendously. But we know that you can use this to bring more people to know you and know that their eternity lies with you. So that's what I ask today, that our tithes and offerings will be used to bring more people in to spend eternity in your presence. And I just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Great choir. If you got your Bibles, if you would open up to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, Acts is in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. A man was working on his lawnmower one day, and he needed to sharpen the blade underneath it. So he put his lawnmower on its side in the garage, and he began to try to remove the blade. And he got his, his, his best wrench, biggest wrench he had, and he tried to pull and yank, but the nut underneath wouldn't move. So he goes and he gets a, a, a four-foot-long pipe, and he puts it over the, the, the wrench for more leverage. And he continues to work and move to try to loosen that nut. Still would not budge. Well, he goes out to his yard and he finds a big, huge, heavy rock. So he takes the rock and begins to hammer on the wrench hard as he could over and over and over. The nut would not budge. By this time, he's getting angry. He's getting irritated. And about this time, his neighbor wanders over, and his neighbor says, you know, I had a lawnmower like that once, and if I recall, the threads on the bolt went the opposite way. They turned the reverse way. And so sure enough, this man took his wrench, and he reversed the direction, and sure enough, the nut loosened and came off with no problem. That's a picture of repentance. The word repentance literally means to turn a different direction. When we go one way apart from the direction God calls us to, apart from him, away from him, and our hearts are broken, and we turn around, we reverse direction and start heading his way. That's what repentance is. And the word repentance has gotten a bad rap, if you will. A lot of people have a negative connotation about repentance. But repentance is one of the greatest words. I mean, repentance is one of the most positive words for someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ and they repent and turn from their sins and turn to him. It's eternal salvation waiting for them. But for the believer, the Christian, repentance is still an important word. It's still an important practice. Because just after we get saved, it's not one and done. We must continue to live a life of repentance. And when we reverse direction, God works and moves and we see things work in miraculous ways. And that's why it's important as Christians that we say yes to repentance we say yes in repentance we've been going through a series called say yes to jesus and the whole premise of this series is about our walk with jesus as believers discipleship if you will and so often we as christians hear people say man i, I need to be a better christian i need to work harder i'm trying hard to be a better christian and it's not going to work because when we boil it down Living the Christian life, following Jesus, is just a series of just saying yes to him again and again and again. And part of saying yes to him, one of the ways we say yes to him is to say yes in repentance. In Acts chapter 3, the early church has just started. Jesus has already ascended. And the two main leaders of the early church, Peter and John, they're preaching God's word. And, and God puts a lame man in their path. A miracle happens. A crowd sees, and Peter takes the opportunity to preach the gospel, to point the crowd to Jesus. And he calls them to repent. And so let's hear the word of God first. Uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 13 to 19. I'm in the New American Standard. You can look in your own translation and listen along. Acts chapter 3, beginning verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to, to which we are witnesses. 
and on the basis of faith in his name is the name of Jesus, which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. Verse 17. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Last verse, verse 19. Therefore, repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, this is your word. What a privilege and honor it is to, to preach your word to hear your word. Open our hearts and our eyes, and I pray for your, I beg you for your anointing, your hand, your favor, because apart from you, I can do nothing. May we rely on the power of your word and not the cleverness of man's words. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. So there was a lame man who was hanging out by the temple. Long story short, Peter and John called him to to rise, and it's a miracle power of the Holy Spirit and the crowd's amazed and Peter begins to preach to them he doesn't say hey look at us man yeah you, you know I got this power on me he says no he just starts preaching and he points the crowd he says all this was done in the name of Jesus Christ and it all comes down to those words in verse 19 therefore repent and there's a there's a lesson for us in repentance. Repentance is not a popular word these days. You don't hear it preached from any pulpits. You hear a lot of churches ignore it. Oh, re- you know, repentance. But folks, listen, repentance, that's at the heart of the gospel, that's at the heart of the Christian life. And so, as we walk through the word this morning, particularly verse 19, I want to show you what repentance means. It means four truths. To say yes in repentance means four things, and I'll share that with you today from the word of God. Number one, First, we, we need to see that repentance is a response. Repentance is a response. It is a response. Now, very beginning of verse 19, look what Paul says. Excuse me, Peter. Peter says, he says, therefore, repent. I've said this before. When you study the Bible, you see the word therefore, you need to ask yourselves what? What's it there for? So that causes us to go back to the previous verse, go back to the previous context. That's how you read the Bible. And so you go back to the previous context, and Peter's preaching the gospel. He's pointing him to to Jesus. I mean, you see there, verse 13, the the God of Abraham, he says, glorified his servant Jesus, the one you delivered this owned. Verse 15, put to death the prince of life, to whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. He's pointing to the cross and the resurrection. Right? Verse 16, on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name Jesus of which has strengthened this man, whom you see and you know. And he says, uh, verse 18, the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. He's preaching the gospel, the good news, that we are separated from God because of our sins. But God sent his son Jesus to do what? To suffer, to die, to be buried, and to rise again for the forgiveness of sins. And so he's pointing them to the cross, to the resurrection. But then notice he says, therefore, based upon all I just preached, he says, repent. We must respond in repentance. It's a response to the gospel. It's a response to the word. Listen, if there was a car that just drove by our church right there, and I I quickly ran out these doors, and and I jumped in, in, in the street, Main Street, and stopped the car, and I said, hey, repent. What do you think the response is going to be? What? Why? They they need to know why they need to respond to the word repent. Listen to what what Paul says, Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to 15. You know, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Repentance is a response. It's a response to the gospel. If a parent says to a child out of the blue, 
behave. The child's going to look at him like, okay, what brought this on? Why are you telling me to behave at this moment? But if a parent says, hey, we're getting ready to go out to eat. Last time we went to the restaurant, you acted up. You were belligerent. We're getting ready to go out to eat again. Behave this time. It's a response. And you see this even when Jesus began his public ministry. Matthew 4, verse 17. Listen to what God's word says. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent. Why? Here we go. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist, same way. Matthew 3, verses 1 to 2. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent. Why? Here we go. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's kingdom. God as king, ruler, having control of minds and hearts, ruling as people get saved and God's control moves and works. You want to hear or know more about the kingdom? Come and join us Wednesday nights. I just started a little series about the kingdom at the very beginning of prayer meetings. So come and join us Wednesday nights. Heard somebody asking Jeff about singing the doxology. We sing the doxology during prayer meetings. Come and join us. John the Baptist came preaching. Repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's a response. You may recall in Luke 19 a wee little man named who? Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was vile. He was a crook. And all of a sudden his life changes. Listen to Luke 19 verse 8. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Now was Zacchaeus given back out of the goodness of his heart? No. He responded in repentance. He says right there, he says, Behold, Lord, Jesus, you are Lord. You're Lord of my life now. I'm turning from my sins. I'm turning. You are repenting. It's a response to the gospel, response to Jesus. It is impossible to repent apart from the redeeming work of Christ. No one could truly repent apart from the redeeming work of Christ. What's the redeeming work of Christ? His death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection from the dead. So we need to understand that repentance, number one, it's a response. A response to the gospel, a response to Jesus, a response to God's initiating this relationship. Listen to Romans 5, verse 8. Paul says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We respond his pursuit of us, our sin Jesus, even when we didn't know any better, when we were blind in our sins, when we were at our worst, he sent his best. Number two, re repentance is not just a response, but number two, it demands a reorientation. Repentance demands a reorientation. A reorientation. What I mean is we must reorient our lives. We must reorient our direction to where God is. He goes on now. Verse 19. Remember, he just said, therefore repent. And then he says, and return. Now some of your translations say, turn back. Other translations say, turn to. King James, New King James says, be converted. That word in the Greek literally means to turn around and return. You were at a place at some point, you were here, you went over here, repent, you're turning around, and you're returning to where you were. This word applies to those who not just are lost and that need to turn to God to get saved, but it also applies to the saved who have forfeited the fellowship of God because of sin, and we need to return to where we were. This word applies to the lost to turn and get saved, and it applies to the saved to return, to get revived, to get renewed. When Jesus tells his church in Revelation 2 verse 4, you remember he tells the church at Ephesus? Revelation 2 verse 4. He says, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. 
They didn't lose Jesus. They left him. Jesus didn't leave them. They left him. That's what he's kind of saying in the words of my favorite musical group, the Beatles. Get back to where you once belonged, right? Get back. Get back to where you once belonged. It's where you belong. We're turning. We must reorient ourselves to where God is. All right, but third, repentance also means we, we find out a reason for repentance. You see, repentance gives us a reason. We are given a reason through repentance. All right, so moving on, verse 19. Remember, he says, therefore, repent. There's your response. And return. That's the reorientation. And then he says, so that. So that. There's a reason right there. So that why? Your sins may be wiped away. And the translations may say blotted out. This Greek word to wipe away, to blot out, it was used in the context of the Old Testament, a creditor. And if somebody had a debt, they would come to the creditor and this debt would be written on wax. And once the person came back to pay their debt, not only would the debt be done with, but the record of it would be removed. And so they'd, they'd, they'd take an instrument and they would smooth out that wax. There'd be no more record. It would be wiped away. It would be blotted out. In the same way, when we as believers and followers of Christ, when we sin, may our sins hinder our fellowship. We still need to repent so we can have our sins wiped away, taken away. Sure, Jesus covers us in, our, in his blood but we're still hindered in what he can do in, around, and through our lives. Think about surgery. I'm not going to ask how many, but some of y'all have probably had surgery to remove maybe a cyst, a cancer, uh, maybe some your tonsils. I'd have my gallbladder removed last year. Why do you have surgery done? Is it because you just kind of feel like it? Oh, you know what, I think I'd, I'd kind of like to have this removed. You know what, I don't want my gallbladder anymore. No, there's a reason. It either hurts, or if you leave it in there, Things are going to get worse. It must be removed. Sin is even more serious. Sin is even more life-threatening. Spiritual life, physical life. And sin must be removed and dealt with. Y'all may have heard there's a report going on in Finland. There's a, a, a trial going on. And... and, and Christians here, preaching God's word, what God's word says about marriage, about homosexuality, being a sin. God's word says it. And the prosecutors there, they made this statement. They, they, they said that the use of the word sin could be harmful. Uh, the, wor the, word of, of the word sin, and there's, there's people pushing to have the word rem sin removed. Sin is harmful. Sin is harmful. People need to hear the word sin. People need to be aware that we are sinners separated from God. The reason why things don't work, our brokenness, we're going to talk about this in three circles, evangelism training tonight. We live in a broken world because of sin. And we all have sinned. Romans 3 verse 23, God's word says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're hopeless. There's nothing we can do about our sins. But God did do something about our sins. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day John the Baptist sees Jesus coming to him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But even when we get saved and we turn from our sins and repent and turn to Jesus, we still sin. And as we continue to sin, our sin will cause a problem, will call, cause a problem in our fellowship with the Lord. I've shared this illustration before. It's a great one to help us understand, as Christians, the importance of repenting. Vance Havner was a well-known preacher years ago. And he said that as a little boy, his dad would take him to an old-fashioned mill. And you may recall, maybe you've seen it before, the old, old water, water wheel, you know, be run by a, by a stream or a creek. And the water would turn the wheel, thus causing a little mechanism to crank and turn, allowing the miller to grind his grain. 
Well, Hadler gave an illustration. He said, suppose one day the miller shows up and the creek is clogged up. It's stopped up. Now, he can use all his force to try to move that wheel. He could try to use all his might and willpower to try to move that wheel. He could try to get the the strongest men and people in in the community to try to move that wheel. But it would do him no good. Nothing would work until he went up the stream and remove the debris, remove the dead leaves, remove the dead twigs, and unclogged what was stopping the stream, allowing the stream to flow back again. Thus, the wheel would turn and the middle would be back in business. But this is how he applied it now to the church. This is what he said. He said, I meet pastors and church workers every week who are straining and striving to make the wheels go around. And he says that they load up their, their schedules and their, their church calendars with services and this and that and do this. So we're going to start this, this and that. But he says, yet nothing is said about the need for repentance in the church. Isn't it about time that we first went up the creek, cleared the channel, and removed the hindering debris of sin from our hearts and our lives? I couldn't say it any better myself. given a reason to repent and things don't work as they have and folks things aren't working in the american church today they're not we need to repent fourth and finally when it comes to repentance we need to understand that repentance brings a renewal repentance brings a renewal for the christian repentance brings a renewal it brings a revival now the very end of verse 19 look what he says there He says, in order that times of refreshing may come. That word refreshing, as I drink my water here, it literally means a refreshing coolness after heat. A refreshing coolness after heat. Those of you living here in the PD, I've lived in in Texas, South Georgia, in the low country, I've been to Nicaragua. I've, I've, I've been to Cambodia. It's hot everywhere. Everywhere you go, everybody's like, oh, you, you've never experienced a, a summer in the PD. All right, I've been to Texas, though. Oh, you've never, it, it's all hot. But you all know in the summertime when it's hot outside, you're just dying. And you go inside to your house or a building, and the cool air condition's been blowing. Talk about refreshing. Talk about what this word means a refreshing coolness after heat but notice pay attention to this where the source comes from refreshing it says he says times of refreshing may come from the presence of the lord it comes from the presence of the lord he says it doesn't come from an air conditioner doesn't come from not thinking about your problem it comes from the presence of the lord so how much more should we as god's people be desperate to want to be in the presence of the lord listen to psalm 63 verse 1 and you just hear the psalmist yearning to be in god's presence psalm 63 verse 1 he says oh god you are my god i shall seek you earnestly my soul thirsts for you my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. This world is a dry and weary land. And nothing will quench a spiritual appetite faster than the things of the world. We watch a little television here. And we get into our sports and enjoy and follow our sports. We read the newspaper we're playing video games, we're listening to secular music, we're going shopping and we're window shopping and buying this and ooh, looking at that. We're playing on social media and all those things by themselves are not bad things necessarily, but they add up. And what begins to happen for the believer, the more time I've seen it happen in my life over and over and over again, 
We spend more time watching TV and the news and the internet and the music and the sports and the, the shopping and the things of the world and the pleasures. And our spiritual vitality begins to go like this. And that's why we must keep running to the living water. John chapter 7, verse 37, 38. Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He promises us those rivers of living water. So brothers and sisters, let's forsake the stale water of the broken cisterns of the world and run to the living water that Jesus promises us. And we'll receive this refreshing when we repent and turn from our sins. Times of refreshing which come from the presence of the Lord. And when we repent, our shame and our guilt in God's eyes and in our hearts are re removed. And then the refreshing comes and he, he washes over us like that cool mountain stream in the summer. I bet if I was to take a poll, and I'm not going to, I bet if I was to ask if how many of us in this room were in a spiritual drought right now, I bet there'd be a good number of hands. And if you're in a spiritual drought, it could be. The first place you need to start is asking yourself, where do I need to repent? Maybe it's unchecked lust. It's, bad, it's a bad habit for us guys especially. It would mean that whether we're looking at something we shouldn't be looking at, we start thinking it. Perhaps we need to repent of pride. Listen, nothing kills spiritual life in Jesus more than pride does. Maybe materialism has been creeping in. Maybe we've been concerned more about what others have. You know, as Jeff said, and it's with all of us, be more concerned of, oh my goodness, the gas prices. Oh my goodness, the 401k. Oh my goodness, my stocks are going down. Maybe we need to repent of lack of prayer reading, meditation, and time spent with God. Or maybe we need to repent of laziness, neglecting our responsibilities. Or perhaps we need to repent in forgetting the gospel and living in legalism. Because even the most faithful Christians who are at church every single week and open up God's word, and boy, I'm faithful, I'm in Sunday school, I'm this and that. But that spiritual drought could still be there. There's no joy because we're too quick to see what's wrong with everybody else, correct everybody else when we have the big log in our eye. And God calls us to repent. It brings a renewal. Repentance for a Christian is not one and done. It is a lifelong journey. A lifelong exercise. The story goes there was an old monk on his deathbed. And as the other monks were gathered around, they heard this older monk talking out loud. And they, they asked, they said, they said, Father, who are you talking to? He says, the angels have come to take me and, and I'm asking for a little more time. A little more time to repent. They said, but you have nothing to repent of. And then he says, I'm not sure if I've ever begun to repent. I'm not sure if I've ever really begun to repent. Repenting is a journey. As we close this morning, maybe you're in a spiritual drought in your life. Maybe you need a refreshing. And before you start thinking about, well, I just need to start reading my Bible more. Or, man, I know my, my, I haven't been praying that much. Or, man, you know I haven't been in church. I haven't been a good Christian. Maybe you need to, to go back to the beginning of verse 19. Therefore, repent. Therefore, repent. Therefore, repent. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment as we get ready. 
we let the Holy Spirit examine our hearts. And what a perfect morning to talk about repentance as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper at the end of our invitation this morning. Some of you already, you know what you need to repent of. Maybe there's a sin, there's an attitude, there's been words, and you know that you need just to go and just reverse direction. Or maybe you need to just say, Lord, I, I desire to repent, but I'm having a hard time. Hey, God desires truth in the innermost being. And he wants you and I to be real and say, God, help me to repent. Help me to truly desire to start running in your, your direction. And maybe still others of you, you need to repent from your sins from the first time. You've been living your life for yourself and things aren't working, there's brokenness. And the reason why things are not working is because you need to get your sin problem right. And our sin problem is worked out when we acknowledge that we're sinners, we realize that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And that God sent His Son because He so loved the world who lived the perfect life you and I should have lived. He died the death we should have died. As he suffered and died, he was buried and rose again from the grave. Hundreds of people saw him and witnessed that. And all he calls us to do is to respond in repentance, to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord Jesus, I turn from my sins. I repent. I turn from that direction. I start, I'm turning towards you. Believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. Confess it with my mouth, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. And maybe today's the day of salvation for you. Or maybe today's the day of repentance. The altar is going to be opened. I've got prayer warriors ready to pray with anybody. But I'm going to pray for you and I. We're going to have a time of letting Holy Spirit move us to repent. Father, you know what's in our hearts and our minds. Even before we ask or speak. And you know the, the sin in our lives. And if many of us are honest in this room this morning or watching online, we feel distant. We're dry. And for many of us, it's because of the choices we've made. They've not led us in the right places. So this morning, right now, we're confessing our desperate need for you. God, we need you. You've promised us that if we confess our sin, you will forgive us and make us clean again. So, Lord, I pray that repentance will be on our hearts, our lips this morning. That each of us would turn around and head another direction back to you, Lord. But we need your help. We offer ourselves in repentance this moment. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand as we have a time of response. Would you come as the Holy Spirit leads you to this morning? <clears throat> Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He the cross at the cross where i first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the day but drops of grief 
the cross at the cross where i first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the day alas and dear Savior bleed and did my sovereign die would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the day my deacons to start making their way forward one of the ordinances the Lord has given to his church is the Lord's Supper, communion. And it's a special time that we as God's people remember his death and we look forward and look to his coming again. But the Bible makes it very, very clear that this is for believers, born again, saved believers. So I say this not being haughty. I say this with caution and love. The supper is for those who know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. So I want to ask, let's have a prayer, prayer hearts, and when I finish, our deacons will move the cloth. They will start preparing to serve. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, search our hearts and try our anxious thoughts. And Lord, I pray that for myself, that in me as pastor, if I have offended or hurt anyone, would you please forgive me? And I pray that you move their hearts to do the same. I pray, Father, that you would Make it so clear if there's anything in our lives we need to repent of and give to you now. Would you please move us to do so? And I pray boldly, Holy Spirit, that if we are not right to take the supper, prevent us. Come so heavy upon us that we cannot reach and take that bread or drink that cup. But I also pray that if we are right in perfect fellowship with you and others, you would just give us, fill us with your peace that surpasses all understanding and comprehension that we may boldly approach your table partake this morning in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. word says in first corinthians 11 that the lord jesus in the night in which he was betrayed he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it so we're going to give thanks to the lord let's pray heavenly father we thank you for the broken body of our lord jesus lord as we partake now and eat the bread we just want to thank you for him breaking his body knowing there was no other way to you except through him in jesus christ's name me hallelujah praise the land hallelujah praise the land my heart 
When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Let's thank him in the same way for the cup. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus who shed his blood to cover our sin, to to be the propitiation of our sin. As we take the cup this morning, we just want to thank you for allowing us to be right with you through the blood of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. sing this with me also. he 
God's word says that in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me God's word goes on to say that for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes Matthew 26, verse 30 says that after singing a hymn, they went out to Mount Golf, so after taking that first supper. So if Jeff's going to lead us out with a hymn, say hello to somebody you don't know before you leave this morning. Jeff? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. 